What's good, guys? This article appeared in today's Chicago Tribune, and I wanted to bring it to the channel because it's an interesting story. Um, it, at the very least, it gives hope. It says, Arrest after seven years finally gives Southside Mother hope. That is a picture of Natasha Stingley. And she's holding a picture of her daughter, Marissa Boyd Stingley. On the day her daughter was shot to death, Natasha Stingley says she went to the lakefront and thought about giving up and jumping in. But God had another plan, she told herself. It would be seven years of struggling with PTSD and marching for justice with other mothers of slain children before she saw it. Earlier this month, Stingley learned that Reginald Reed, a man from her old neighborhood of Park Manor, had been arrested and charged with killing her 19-year-old daughter, Marissa Boyd Stingley. I just kept saying, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, after I heard the news, Stingley said. I know this is only the beginning. I still have to face the trial. But she has made it this far, and now there is finally hope. I don't think the police would have gotten him after all this time if they didn't think it was him. Her daughter was killed on June the 25th, 2013, just blocks from her home after a night at the lake with new friends. Boyd Stingley and four other people were riding in a car when Reed's black SUV pulled alongside at 73rd and King Drive, according to prosecutors. Reed, alone in the sedan, began to look inside their car, and two of the people asked him what he wanted. When he didn't answer, someone said, Right with your cockeyed ass, apparently referring to Reed's misaligned left eye, prosecutor said. Reed pulled out a gun and fired several times at the car, hitting everyone inside. Boyd Stingley, sitting in the middle of the back seat, was the only one killed. After the shooting, Stingley heard that the person who killed her daughter had a cocked eye, and she knew a man called Rico in her neighborhood who fit that description. She passed that information on to detectives who came across Reed after a search of the neighborhood. In court documents, investigators said Reed's left eye is misaligned. Reed was placed in a photo lineup and the driver of the car identified him as the shooter. Detectives wanted the other three victims in the car to identify him as well, but they could not be located according to court documents. About four years later, detectives caught up with a second victim who viewed a lineup and identified Reed. Another three years passed before Reed was taken into custody on November the 5th, the same day Stingley had gone to her old neighborhood with flowers and balloons she released for her daughter. She was later confronted by a woman in the neighborhood who told her the police had the wrong man. She told me he was a nice man who sometimes helped her with her children and had kids of his own and dogs he cared for daily, Stingley said. I told her, well, he wasn't nice the day he killed my baby. If it wasn't, I would apologize and say, let him go. I don't want to harm anyone who is innocent. Stingley said she lost more than 40 pounds as she dealt with the grief and the trauma and was diagnosed with PTSD four years after the slaying. She's living in the East Woodlawn area now and said she's feeling peaceful. I am more in line with my spirituality. I've learned how to control myself and my spirit is peaceful, she said when asked how things have changed. God is good. He's just good. Reed's next court appearance is scheduled for November the 30th, Stingley said she'll be watching. I followed the link and went to the article previous to this that they did on her. Uh, it says, Mother of Slain Teen, What Happened to My Baby? That's a picture of Natasha Stingley, uh, again, holding a picture of her daughter, Marissa Boyd Stingley. And this is from 2013. The same lady actually did this article, uh, the original article. And I'm going to read it. It says, Two weeks have passed since a neighbor knocked on Natasha Stingley's door with the grim news. Her 19-year-old daughter, Marissa, had been gunned down just blocks from their park manor home. I asked her, where's Marissa at? Where's my baby? Stingley said, fighting back tears. She said Marissa got shot and pointed to her eye. Stingley said she talked to detectives later that day and hasn't heard from them since. 
Now, about two weeks later, she fears her daughter may have been forgotten. I've done everything in my power to keep my kids safe, said Stingley, a single mother who also has two sons, 6 and 18. This is the one time I couldn't. I just want to know why. What happened to my baby? Police reported no arrests as of Wednesday and could provide no description of the shooter, except that he fled in a black SUV after opening fire at another car about 2.30 a.m. on June the 25th at a stoplight at 73rd and King Drive. Marissa Boyd Stingley was one of the five passengers inside that car. She was shot in the head and another woman, a neighbor, was wounded in the hand. Three men, one age 18 and two age 20, were also shot. One in the chest, one in the shoulder, and the other in the hand, police said. Boyd Stingley was the only one who died. Natasha Stingley said she had felt something wasn't right that night and had called her daughter early that morning, worried. I woke up and sat straight up in my bed and called her, she said. It was shortly before 1 a.m. I asked her where she was and told her I loved her and to be careful. God woke me up to tell my baby I love her one last time and I thank him for that. About two hours later, Stingley heard banging on her first floor window and rushed to the door, thinking it was her daughter, but it was her neighbor saying her daughter had been shot. The next moments are a blur to Stingley. She remembers cursing and crying and finally screaming for the neighbor to leave her house. She could only think of what more she, she could only think of what more she could have done to save her daughter. Earlier this year, her daughter had come home from Central State University in Ohio, concerned about her mother's health health after an accident. Stingley had fallen down and was knocked unconscious, unconscious, cracking her front teeth, she said. While Stingley underwent medical tests, her daughter cared for her six-year-old brother, Lavelle. Still, Stingley said she did not feel at ease with her daughter's decision to come home. My chest was heavy and I didn't know why, she said. I didn't like the company she was keeping. Something just didn't feel right. She worried about a young man Marissa had met, a man who was in the car when the shots were fired. Neighbors had warned Stingley about the man, telling her he was no good, she said. The man and her daughter, along with other friends, had been at the lake on the day of the shooting and were on their way home. None of the people, none of the people who were with her daughter that night had contacted, has contacted her to share information about what led up to the shooting, Stingley said. I want the people in the car to sit down with me and the police. I want to know what happened that night, Stingley said. Why isn't the mayor, the governor, the first lady coming to my house for my baby? She was good. She wasn't a criminal. She was a student. Why doesn't anyone care? I laid a foundation of morals, respect, and decency for my kids, Stingley said as she sat in her living room next to her daughter's high school diploma. My daughter's only mistake was going out that night with possibly the wrong people. Did she deserve to die because of that mistake? This hole in my heart is where my daughter used to be. I have to be strong, but things will never be the same. Stingley busies herself with her two other children, Lavelle and Thomas, 18. Lavelle at six doesn't quite understand that his big sister is gone. Marissa ran away, he said. I miss her. Please find Marissa. Thomas just visited SIU at Carbondale, where he is scheduled to attend in the fall. He works filing cases at the Cook County Circuit Court. Marissa was a well-rounded person, he said Wednesday as he was leaving his job. She cared about others more than herself. Thomas said he would like to know why there is so much ammunition and weapons in the street. I think they should open a draft and send these people to the military since they like to handle weapons, Thomas said. As for the person who killed his sister, Thomas said, I want them to come forward. It sounds like Thomas is a very intelligent young man. Um, just from that one simple statement, very intelligent. So I wanted to bring this... Um, article to the channel because it touched me and also it's just a repeat it's kind of a repeat thing that you see in these cases um, and I can only say specifically coming out of Chicago because that's a lot of the cases that I cover where something happens and nobody comes forward um, to say anything and that just sickens me I know they have this uh, code on the street where you know, snitches are looked at a certain way, but if you're in a car with your friends and someone pulls alongside and shoots your friend in your vehicle, you wouldn't feel a moral obligation to come forward and say something. That's where I can't connect. I can't connect that. I wasn't raised like that, and um, 
I would feel obligated in my spirit to say something. So that's why I have such a hard time with, excuse me, some of these stories. Um, another reason why I wanted to bring this story to my channel is because it gives hope. Um, she was shot in June of 2013. And some seven years later, they have now arrested someone in this case. So it is possible. And if you'll notice, um, I do want to bring this up because it is important. Um, a lot of times we get frustrated with the details that the police um, give out on the front end. A lot of times they don't give out information on the front end. And there's a reason why. Uh, one of the big clues in this case would have been that this gentleman had something wrong with his eye. Okay? This is a good example. Had maybe they said that in the beginning, um, things could have been a little different. So I understand why they don't do that. But in cases where it really could have made a difference with this gentleman's eye being the main focus of why he even shot at the car, um, I mean, that was a really big clue that they didn't have to sit on. But you can see in the article... Um, Where the officer say could provide no description of the shooter except that he had fled in a black SUV. Well, had they said at the time that this gentleman had something wrong with his eye and he drove a black SUV, somebody out there would have known who that was. Um, that would have been a very important clue to have released to the public. Uh, so I, I don't understand their call on that one. But regardless, I'm tickled that this woman has now um, gotten someone to be held accountable for this crime. And hopefully things will go well in the court case. So, I will try to keep you updated as best I can. I don't know that the Chicago Tribune will follow it any more than this, but I will try to. So, on that note, I'm going to end this video. And thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it.